Today, we're very lucky to be joined by two speakers who have a lot of experience talking about Chile as activists on Chile. Uh, Victor Figueroa Clark, who's a scholar of Latin American political history, the PhD from the LSE, and uh, an author, the author of a political biography of Salvador Allende, revolutionary Democrat. Uh, we're also joined by Cristina Navarrete, who is a political activist, Chilean, with 40 years experience working in the NHS um, and has been very active in the solidarity movement in, in the UK for many, many years, in fact, since arriving in the UK from Chile. Um, I'm not Chilean, like our two speakers. Uh, I'm not even an expert on Chilean history, but my childhood was colored by the images, the symbols and sounds of Chile's democratic revolutionary period. My parents fled Chile in late 1973 after the military coup. Uh, where they went to London and were involved in the Chile Solidarity Campaign. And so my political education, and much like that of other children of exile, Pablo, uh, Victor, and, and others, um, was really in hearing our parents talk about Chile and that period in particular and what followed, uh, involved in marches in solidarity with the people in Chile. And as such, Chile still occupies a very important place in my political imagination, but in fact, it occupies an important place in the political imagination of the left, not just in Chile, not just in Latin America, but really across the world. And there's a number of reasons for this, and I hope we'll get into that with today's discussion. But the three years uh, that constitute the government of popular unity came at the beginning of a period, a decade of counter-revolutions. And Chile's counter-revolution, the military coup that took place in 73, and the military dictatorship thereafter, was amongst the most brutal. But it's not only for that reason that Chile's counter-revolution has been so important in the formation of what came after in the politics of the last 40 years. Chile was also a testing ground uh, for particular political economic strategies but also for the way that the United States would intervene in certain contexts around the world, particularly in Latin America, and would continue to intervene and adapt its interventions. Today, we're going to focus initially on the three years, well, the, le the period leading up to the three years of popular unity government, Salvador Allende himself, and then we're also going to discuss the legacy of that period. Um, I'd like to thank Alborada, for the invitation to, to host today's event. Uh, it's a privilege, uh, it's an honor to be able to be part of this, this discussion. Um, so thank you to Pablo, thank you to Nick. For those of you who don't know that much about Alborada, Alborada is uh, an organization that was set up just over 10 years ago. It just uh, celebrated its, its 10th anniversary recently. Um, and it's dedicated to, to providing a more critical perspective on Latin American politics and culture, engaging with those elements that aren't covered by mainstream media. If you'd like to support Alborada, uh, I suggest you go to alborada.net forward slash support. Alborada is an independent organization and really to be able to continue providing space for this kind of discussion, these debates, um, it really counts on contributions from those who, who follow Latin American politics. So without further ado, we'll get into the discussion. Uh, we're going to structure it like this. I'm going to have a sort of informal discussion with, with Victor and Christina asking questions. There'll also then be space for questions from others who are online at the moment. Um, you can post your questions on the general chat or you can send me questions privately on chat. Please, when you post your questions, make it clear whether or not you would like to appear uh, with the video uh, actually asking your question or if you'd just prefer that I ask it on your behalf. If you have a very pressing question in the middle of our initial discussion, you can also do that and I'll, and I'll see whether there's a, a chance we can, we can squeeze that in before we get into the plenary discussion. So I'd like to start by 
uh, asking Victor as, as our, our resident historian here. Um, maybe you could set the, the context a little bit, talk about the political context. First of all, who was Salvador Allende? What was his position within the left? Somebody who perhaps wasn't always seen as the most viable leader within the left, but then became. Um, how was the left organized? What was UP? What was Unidad Popular? And what was the context in which, or, or what were the conditions in which UP was able to come to power through the election in 1970? Over to you, Victor. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Giuliano. Um, well, I think, well, Salvador Allende was um, probably the best known Chilean left wing politician of his uh, era. He used to joke that he was as well known as Coca Cola. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, it's not an exaggeration. The man had stood as president um, three times before the 1970 election campaign, and he'd stood in about uh, six uh, uh, parliamentary. Uh, congressional and senatorial elections as well in constituencies across the country and in each one of his presidential campaigns you know he was extremely active traveling the length of you know Chile doesn't really have much breadth but you know the length of the entire country and speaking to um, meeting after meeting after meeting you know sometimes he would do 13 14 meetings in a day on a presidential campaign uh, speaking to thousands of people uh, he had a tremendous amount of energy, uh, tremendous charisma, a tremendous connection uh, with uh, the people of Chile. But he was also someone that had a tremendous connection with um, the, the political class in Chile. He was someone who over those decades had been a minister of health, had been vice president of the Senate, had been president of the Senate. You know, this is a personality who kind of defined his period and defined the Chilean left in many ways. Um, how did uh, you know, he come to lead the popular unity? Uh, and what was the popular unity? Well, the, the, the popular unity was the kind of, uh, uh, the coalition of the uh, historic parties of the Chilean left, the Communist Party and the Socialist Party, um, with um, new political parties that had split from the Christian uh, Democrats who were inspired by liberation theology, you know, they were kind of Christian socialists, as it were, or Christian Marxists, um, and also some parties that belong to the kind of historic center of, Ch of the Chilean uh, political system, such as the Radical Party. And um, this coalition achieved some kind of coherence around uh, a political program um, which was, you know, the, pro the program of the future government of the popular unity. Um, but the consistency, that, that program was really built around a message that hadn't changed in its fundamentals since um, the early 1950s. And it was that consistency and clarity best expressed by Salvador Allende that enabled the left to achieve a kind of hegemony um, in uh, Chilean politics on the eve of 1970. It was a hegemony that essentially meant that the Christian Democrat program going into that election in 1970 um, was uh, a mirror of the popular unity program uh, in, 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 in its main um, uh, con components. Now, there was a, also like a social and an economic component to the victory uh, of the popular unity. Um, and this was partly uh, to do with the mobilization of civil society uh, that happened during the 1960s, not just in Chile, um, and which was a result kind of uh, of global events. You know, the, the 60s were the decade when the Soviet Union achieved a kind of parity um, in military terms, but also in economic terms with uh, the United States. It's uh, the decade when capitalism, even in the developed world, was showing great signs of crisis. You know, you've got the civil rights movement in the United States, Paris, 68, in France, similar in West Germany. Um, in Britain, you've got you know, um, the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. Um, and all of this in combination with the national liberation struggles of the peoples of the formerly colonized world, Vietnam, Algeria, uh, many countries in Africa, which begin to take up arms against colonial powers uh, or succeed in expelling them. Um, and this creates kind of uh, an impetus towards radical change. You know, it's, it's in the air. 
and in Latin America, this is best um, uh, expressed, I guess, by the success of the Cuban Revolution at the end of the 50s and the kind of polarization that this creates in the continent and also the way in which it sucks the United States further into uh, Latin America, uh, supporting um, the overthrow of democratic governments in Brazil, for example, the government of João Goulart, um, and uh, increasing support for the military and intelligence structures of uh, the Latin American state uh, across, across the entire region, which leads to a kind of polarization. Um, and in economic terms, you know, the success of the popularity was kind of built on the failure of Christian democracy. Um, Christian, the Christian Democrats had come into power promising a revolution in re liberty that would be neither socialist nor capitalist and, you know, that would achieve some kind of magical uh, transformation of Chile. But by the end of that government, it was clear they hadn't been able to tackle inflation, which was uh, uh, around 30 percent. Unemployment, real unemployment, about 20 percent. Um, economic stagnation, you know, their best uh, GDP figure was uh, a growth figure was 2.4%, but in some years it was less than 1%. Chile's debt to the United States increased uh, uh, by a large amount. Um, and the fundamental inequality of Chilean society didn't alter. 2% of the population controlled 45% uh, of GDP by the end of their government. This, in combination with their willingness to use violent repression to put down um, the, the kind of social effervescence that was uh, taking a place in Chile with massacres in Santiago, in uh, the massacre of striking miners in El, uh, El Salvador mine, and the massacre, the most famous one uh, that Victor Jara sang about um, of the uh, pobladores in Puerto Montt, um, you know, re really took the shine as we might say, off, the Christ, off Christian democracy and off this idea of revolution in liberty. You know, um, once they had not all the rain in the South, Victor Jara said, was going to wash the blood off the hands of this government. And all of this, I think, you know, Allende's personality, the crisis in Christian democracy, the crisis in Chilean economy and society, the global effervescence, all stood behind uh, the victory of the popular unity in uh, 1970. Sorry, I had a tr trouble unmuting myself there. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Victor. Um, that sets up, up, up quite nicely, actually, for for a first question for Christina, because Christina, it was really in this period in the years leading up to the 1970 election that you uh, you had your most important period of political education, political formation. You became involved in political activism. Um, I was wondering, perhaps, whether you might be able to discuss a little bit how you came to be involved in political activism on the left what it was like uh, in that period in the, in the run up to the election um, and how really m momentum was developed through society, also perhaps through culture, obviously, uh, Victor's mentioned Victor Jara, but there were many singers, uh, artists, poets of this period who contributed to, to building momentum uh, behind the, the Upe government. So I'll pass over to you, Christina, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Giuliano. It's, um, it's, it's very nice for me to be here tonight, but also it's very nice to see you hosting this meeting because you are the son of a couple that was very dear to my hand, to, to me, and who um, are the faces and names that I remember when I first arrived to this country in 1976. And um, I, I really, it's, it's very touching for me that you are now here sharing this um, conversation. Well, um, I, maybe I am a little bit, um, I wouldn't say the wrong person, but I, my, my, my story is perhaps a little bit different. Um, and in the sense that, um, first of all, I come from a, a very working class background. My, father was a big layer, my mother had a newspaper kiosk, and my family belonged and very much were strong supporters of the Christian Democrat Party in Chile. Especially because um, for some of the reasons that Victor had mentioned, it was a party that um, in a way, um, because of the Catholic background, um, 
managed to appeal a, a vast se section of, 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 of the working class in Chile with um, some of its relatively progressive policies up to a certain extent. Um, but certainly um, with this idea that they wanted to make a revolution in liberty, but, but this was, which was proven eventually not to be exactly what they wanted. Um, but it was, it was during the period of Frey that I became involved in, in, in very much in politics. I was still very young, um, but, but certainly this, this party who was a, a little bit influenced by the theology of liberation that was actually um, uh, influencing many people uh, across the world, I should say in different forms, but certainly in Latin America, was trying to introduce some reforms with the support of the United States that had realized that unless they did that, um, that was the only way they wish they could counteract the wishes and the, the, the rising of the um, feelings uh, of, 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 of a more, uh, in a way, socialist um, actions in Chile. So they, they were sort of trying to, to, to advocate a, a, a rising desire for uh, more drastic changes. So it is in that context that I, I, was, I was Catholic, very much involved in, in, in religious movement. And it is in, it, it is in this situation that I, I, I get to the university in 1970 when Allende is elected. And during this, this period, not only the Christian Democrat party became more and more um, a right wing party opposing some of the most um, basic measures and policies that the, the popular unity was trying to introduce. But really, it, it, it began to, to um, align, definitely align with, align with the more reactionary um, elements of the party and of the Chilean rights. So it is within, in this, in this, in this uh, context, and by the way, I was by then, um, vice president of the student union of my faculty as a Christian Democrat, but it was more and more, uh, I could see more and more the contradictions of that party with, with, with the ideas of, of justice, with solidarity and, and all the things that, that, that I felt were important as, as a Christian initially. Um, but then as I developed my political consciousness, um, I, I, I saw them in a, in a different form or a way. So it is it is in that situation that and that I I I I I, I realized that I could no longer stay in that party, and that together with with my with the the, the experience that I was living when when Allende was elected, I, that that seeing the changes, the the very positive. Uh, changes that he was introducing in, in the society, all the, the measures that it was directly benefiting um, the, the, the working class and certainly the, the people of, of, of surrounding me and my class, that, um, that I, I, I certainly um, began to um, left the, the Christian Democrat and then after a few months I, I, I joined in my case the MIR, one of the uh, movement that although it wasn't directly in the government, it was certainly um, uh, supporting some of the um, policies that Agenda um, wanted to carry out. And, and this is a theme that we can probably discuss later because I think it's a very important point for the left in Chile and for the left in Latin America and in general. There, the, so uh, uh, that's how I entered politics that's how i entered um, and that's how I, I i became um a supporter of the popular unity i became committed to um the program that again they was trying to uh, to introduce um and um really it, it was a time where there there were so many um changes going on in chile that that were reflected um as a student at, at the university, students being organized to 
um, carry out voluntary works, literacy campaigns in, 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 the, in the, the, the peasants were organized to trying to not recover, but also to, to uh, pr produce the land that had been given today to them by the reforms, real reforms that had been introduced for agenda. So there were measure, measure after measure that agenda government was introducing that was affecting directly and in a very positive way the working class in my country. And I'm producing the changes that I felt we wanted to achieve as a society. Um, uh, it was interesting for me, it was interesting to see how the workers were being organized in the factories and how they were uh, meeting, discussing how to coordinate, produce, uh, the, organize the direction of the, of the factories. Um, it was the, the, the period where the industrial belts were formed. Um, so it, it was an effervescence at all level. Um, added by the visit of Fidel Castro to Chile, which is interesting because although Allende, as we all know, and, and the people who have studied Allende know better than I do, um, Allende's um, model or, or way of achieving socialism was different to the one that the Cuban Revolution has used. He had no problem in inviting um, Fidel and certainly listening the speeches of Fidel in Chile was something that, at least to me, um, produced a great impact and made me really think um, that my, my not, not was only my heart on the left, but my action had to be on the left as well. And I had to start supporting. Um, and I was quite happy to start working and supporting the government of Salvador Allende and um, the policies and, and the program of the popular unity at the time. So in a way, I, I wasn't a, a classical left-wing militant um, that um, grew with Allende, the popular unity, but I was one of the people, and as many, many people that I know, that were converted by the reality, by the action, by, by the, the actions themselves um, that were being implemented during the popular unity. And um, and certainly it was where I felt my, my action had to be. So that's how I, is how I became involved. Fantastic, thank you, Christina. Um, I'll, I'll go back to Victor because in fact, maybe you can elaborate on some of what Christina's talked about there. She's talked about the, the UPE's policy program. Uh, you can perhaps talk about what, what it is that, that Salvador Allende proposed to do with his government that was revolutionary in, in the Chilean context. Um, but then they also maybe speak about how the developments in Chile uh, related to what was going on in, in the wider world. And if I can just complicate that with one, one more question, a third, a third element, um, I, I suppose as we're discussing the three years in government, we also need to start thinking about what happened that led to 73 and the coup. So how was an opposition forming that would provide sufficient support along with, of course, external uh, interference, intervention, but for example, particularly in the Christian Democrats, the split in, split in the Christian Democrats, what was, what was the impact of that, uh, that and how did it lead to the coup? So over to you, Victor. Thank you. <clears throat> nice, simple questions. <laughs> I mean, the first one is relatively simple because I mean, um, essentially, I've got here a, a copy of uh, an original copy of the uh, Popular Unity program that my parents uh, brought back from Chile, and uh, you know this this program is effectively a program of um, uh, nationalisations to eliminate monopolies in the financial sector, in the industrial sector, in the service sector. Uh, a uh, proposal for a massive land reform to do away with the system of latifundio, which was a an almost feudal um, land ownership system, and uh, not just land ownership, but control of the people that lived on that land. Um, there were strong elements of what we might call governance and anti-corruption measures. Uh, you know, there were commitments to reduce um, ex ex um, 
uh, extortionate wages, for example, reduce foreign travel and jaunts and those kind of things. Um, also, uh, a judicial reform um, in order to make uh, um, legal recourse more accessible to ordinary people. Um, there were uh, a, a broad a series of measures that we might call democratization measures. Um, you know, uh, democratizing trade unions and giving them a role in society and in decision making, democratizing universities and giving students and staff a say in how those universities were run, bringing in um, and reinforcing reforms that the Christian Democrats had already, you know, begun under their government, which had, but that had been largely inadequate. Um, and bringing in an economic democratization as well, not just through redistribution measures, um, but also by uh, planning to in, bring workers into decision making in those state owned areas of the economy and in the cooperative areas of the economy, but also strengthening their rights in the private sector as well. Um, there was also a, a housing program, you know, uh, huge numbers of Chileans uh, were living in shanty towns uh, at this time, and the government had a program to build quality uh, housing. For these, uh, for, for these people. Housing which in many cases is still standing today, um, as someone told me the other day. There was also uh, a set of measures around um, restitution for the indigenous population of Chile, the Mapuche people. They were to be given their own university. Um, lands were to be returned to them that had been taken um, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century and, uh, uh, and in the 19th century. And there were packages of social reforms around that were really about social protection of the most vulnerable in society, particularly targeted at women and children, uh, I have to say, but also about unemployment benefit and pensions and um, many things that we might expect from a, um, perhaps a social democratic government. And what, what I would argue makes this program uh, revolutionary is uh, partly in its foreign policy, for example, um, you know, Chile was to become a, a member of the non-aligned movement and pursue an anti-imperialist foreign policy, which is one reason why they recognized the Cuban government and invited Fidel Castro to Chile. But they also recognized other governments that uh, previous Chilean governments hadn't recognized, such as China, the uh, People's Republic of China, North Korea, East Germany, um, and other countries in the, in the socialist uh, bloc at the time. And this, I think, uh, this challenge to imperialism was what made the popular unity particularly dangerous. But beyond that, it was this idea of democratization um, that was immensely dangerous because it was this democratization that threatened to make the popular unity um, irreversible really, and really transform society in its forms and function so it wasn't just a superficial set of changes. It was, these were changes that were aimed at creating and enabling a new type of human being to develop, one who would be in harmony with their fellow human beings and um, you know, in harmony with, with the kind of world, as we might sort of say today. Um, and you, you asked a, a question about you know, how this related to the wider world. Well, I think it relates to it mainly through the force of example, you know, this later became an, an example around the world. And we can talk about that, I hope, uh, uh, shortly. But you also asked about the opposition and how this really began uh, to develop. Well, you know, the, the successes of the popular unity were actually pretty notable. You know, uh, in the first year, uh, industrial production increased uh, pretty massively by about 13% real incomes increased by about 20%. Um, 500,000 people were housed just in one year. Um, in the first year of the agrarian reform, um, they took, they expropriated more land than the, pop, uh, than the Christian Democrats had done in six years. Um, and there were huge increases in enrollment in education and so on. And this, uh, and they nationalized the copper industry, which is still the mainstay of the Chilean economy today. So how, how did opposition begin to manifest itself to a government that seemed to be doing so well? Well, I think there were uh, two issues here, really. First was that the, initially the opposition to the popularity was um, divided, fragmented, and uh, rudderless, I would argue. The far right had nothing to offer except for sedition and terrorism. 
the Christian Democrat bases, you know, a big part of the party membership was um, well, well disposed towards the popular unity and was happy to work with the popular unity. It was the leadership that was much more severely divided and uh, much more hostile, particularly the, the wing under former President Frey. And obviously, as you mentioned, you had uh, foreign support, American support for the opposition, which I think incentivized an intransigence in that opposition. It organized and coordinated the seditious opposition, but also the political and social opposition. It provided funds, it provided expertise, acted in general as a kind of force multiplier in military terms of what the opposition alone couldn't have achieved, I think. And where we see it really begin to crystallize is with the assassination of Frey's former Minister of Interior in uh, June 1971, Berezovic. I can't say that surname, but it's, it's Zuzovic, <laughs> I think. Um, and this assassination uh, really precipitated a right-wing turn in the Christian uh, Democrats. Frey comes back to Chile, begins to um, uh, take control in the shadows of the party. And um, eventually, towards the end of the year, this leads to the creation of a kind of social and political movement in, of opposition to the uh, popular unity, which is beginning to ally itself with the far right in politics and in the military. And it's this alliance, this kind of unholy alliance between this right wing of the Christian Democrats and uh, US imperialism, we might call it, and uh, the far right and their seditious efforts that really, uh, in coordination with the economic difficulties that US actions take in the outside world, um, such as plunging, you know, helping the price of copper to fall and um, restricting credits to Chile and so on, along with support for media, right-wing media, that really begin to sort of uh, shift the popular unity away from success and towards eventual failure. But there are, there are also other reasons, um, but I'll leave it there for now. Thanks a lot, Victor. And, and I know um, asking a historian to compress in that way is, is, a, is, a, is a challenge, but you did so nicely. So thanks for, for bringing in those different elements. And, and um, I'll go back to Christina here, because growing up, I, I heard a lot about the, the period of hope that was the, the, the Ube government, what it was to live in that period. In fact, my mother, when, after, after she, she left Chile, never went back. And one of the reasons she said was that she didn't want to go back to see many of her former comrades accommodated to what was essentially a continuation of, of the Pinochetista regime. Uh, and she wanted to maintain something of that memory of the hope. So I, I wanted to see perhaps whether you could uh, elaborate on, on what your experience was of, of those three years. Um, how were you engaging in, in political activity? But we also have a question here about culture that I'm not sure whether you might also be able to to take on, which is how Allende and, and Lupe promoted, supported culture, particularly Cine Chileno, Nueva Canción, Brigada Amor Parra. So if, if you're able to do that, that, that would be great. If not, then maybe Victor can pick on, up on that afterwards. Uh, and in fact, Cristina, perhaps you could also talk about the tensions which you mentioned earlier, the tensions within the left in particular. Mir, which was the organization you joined, uh, didn't officially support Allende during the 70 election. So what was that about? And, and then how did it support uh, develop over, over the coming period? Thanks. Yes, I mean, it's quite a few things. But I, mean, I just, first I wanted to say that what Victor has described about um, what were the policies and the successes of the popular unit at that, the unity at that time in all the fields that he mentioned, housing, health, education, were exactly um, the reasons that, um, uh, um, let me to um, leave the, the, the Christian Democrat Party and, and, and join the Popular Unity because it was it was so clear how the agenda the program that agenda had uh, uh, proposed and was implemented uh, were benefiting 
the majority of, of, of the working class in Chile and the, and, and the, the poorest sectors of the population in Chile. And in fact, the majority of the society, I should say as well, because some of the sectors of the middle classes were said also being, uh, having benefit. It was exactly that situation that made me um, have throw my, my, my support to, 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 to the, the popular unity. Um, and, and, and one of the, one of the things that I, 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 I so much, uh, it was on, it wasn't only my perception, it was, uh, it was then that manifested in, in the year 1973, where despite the, all the difficulties that the popular unity was facing and all the boycott and the campaign and everything that Victor has um, mentioned, where people had to queue for food because the food was being hidden and, and there was no transport because, you know, there was um, strikes by the owners of the major transport uh, public. In spite of though, that all that difficulties, Allende in the elections, um, um, some municipal and uh, uh, some elections in, in March 73 managed to increase the popular vote. In, 19, in 1970, uh, when Agenda is, 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 is elected, the, each of the three main parties, um, the, the, the Christian Democrat, the right-wing National Party, and the Popular Unity, each of them obtained about 33% of the vote. And it was only in the second round that the Christian Democrats decided to support the popular unity that agenda was uh, elected as president of Chile. But in, in, in March, he increased that vote to 44%. So, so indicating that whatever he was, um, whatever he was implementing, whatever his program was, was, was certainly um, being successful. And it is because one of, this is what perhaps one of the reasons as well why the in United States decided that um, that was not going it was not going to be possible to defeat agenda through the democratic um, um, uh, way, but it started I think to put him in, in, start put in, in, in March the plan to um, overthrow him eventually uh, with a military coup. It was it was quite clear that that, that was not going to be possible. Um, you also, uh, I mean, one of the, the, the question, I think it is people in the left has had that responsibility as well to discuss. I think men, Victor barely mentioned about other reasons why there were also problems in, 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 in the agenda government. It's because it was clear that, I mean, agenda was, I mean, um, quite clear um, that he wanted to, um, um, build um, socialism through the democratic um, path um, and he, he he was in his program and he always said it um, but on the other hand it was the the more radical left when we could call him including with the Maya where um, could see um, and, 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 and the critic that were being put forward was that it was going to be very difficult to make the changes in the society that the program wanted to make without really making uh, radical changes to the system and indeed uh, at some point um, forcing or, or going a little bit outside the democratic institution. And that tension that was there undoubtedly during the period of the popular unity is something that is still, I think, an important debate today how we can really achieve the changes when these changes affect so directly the interests of, 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 of the oligarch and the imperialism within the democratic frame. But on the other hand, um, how we can achieve um, a, a, another society, a more just society, if it's not with the will of the majority of the people? And is it, is it um, a system imposed outside the democracy, outside democracy, a valid system where not where where not everybody has been able to um, to participate.
but I guess that's not the theme of today, but there's no doubt that those tensions existed. And I think exist in the left still today. Um, the older I get, um, um, the more contradiction I get in my head because I, uh, the more, the more I think it's, I think it's important um, to achieve changes in democracy. But living in the world that we live today, seeing how all the democratic institutions have been kidnapped by the big imperialist powers, I wonder whether we that is ever going to be a real possibility. Leaving that aside. One of the important aspects during the period of the popular unities as well is, is what you, you've mentioned, is this incredible um, effervescence, I cannot pronounce that word, in, in all forms of arts and the creativity that was, that was surrounded everywhere, in, in music, in theater, in, in, in painting, at all levels. And, and I don't have to tell perhaps many people um, how important was the, the, the development of the birth of the Nueva Canción Chilena and, and all the music that was created at that time, supporting the process, um, which is still valid today. I mean, it's, it's incredible to go to Chile. Even today, the, 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 the big demonstrations that occurred last year in Chile in October 2019, the main songs that you were listening, that the younger generation were listening and singing, were songs that had been written and played and, and they were produced during the period of the popular unity. And, and that, was, that was something that, that undoubtedly was an important characteristic of that period as well. Uh, but it wasn't only on that, it was in, in all form, as I said, of culture. Um, I, I say the music because it's the one that certainly I'm, I'm, I know a little bit more. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and, and I would agree that those questions you, you, you mentioned uh, remain crucial questions for the, for the left today. Uh, maybe we can get into uh, their relationship to that period in, in, in our discussion afterwards. Um, Victor, back to you. So on the 11th of September, 1973, uh, the, there was the, the military coup, the, the first September the 11th, or in fact for, for Catalan independence activists, the second September the 11th. Um, in your book, there's a, there's a tension which you, which you develop quite nicely, which is that on the one hand, you discuss what was unique about the UP government. It was something definitely Chilean. It was something definitely constructed with uh, Salvador Allende's personality, um, and that that was in some sense what helped it develop. And on the other hand, it also seems that Salvador Allende's commitment to that particular mode of governance, that particular mode of political engagement, um, perhaps limited the UPE's ability to resist what was coming in 73. Now, you you don't give total credence to, to any of the, the major theses, whether he should have armed the people, whether he could have resisted the US, but you said there's, you say there's some truth in all of them. Mm. Um, so, so I'd like you to perhaps elaborate on that, and that, that relates to, to one of the questions we've got here, particularly about whether he could have done more to win over the military, not just the constitutionalist elements. So that's the first element. The second, which perhaps you could then uh, go on to, is about legacy. Do you think that the way in which, the particular way in which uh, the Allende government came to an end contributed to its legacy, uh, contributed to the way it was, was maintained within the popular imagination, the political imagination of the left, and, and still today um, is a source of hope for many on the left? That's um, two <clears throat> very good questions there, uh, Giuliano. Um, I mean, Every hero has an Achilles heel, right? And um, what, what is a strength in some situations can uh, develop into a weakness when those circumstances change. And I think uh, the Popular Unity and Agenda as president of the Popular Unity is, is a kind of example of that. Um, the Popular Unity uh, demonstrated uh, the viability of Agenda's institutional gradualist path uh, to revolution um, and the first year of his government and I would argue perhaps 
the the survival of his government uh, once the screws were really put on uh, Chile is testament to the strength of Chile's institutionality, but also the way in which uh, Allende's uh, path to socialism, the popular unity's path to socialism, was actually aligned with Chile's political and cultural and social traditions. Um, and this was, as you've just sort of alluded to, one of the sources of uh, strength for this process. Um, I think there, there, there clearly were areas uh, where, in retrospect, the popular unity could have, an agenda in particular perhaps, could have uh, taken action in order to forestall uh, the opposition. So, for example, um, in, uh, uh, after, the, after his election, Allende wanted to link the nationalization of COPA uh, to uh, um, a broader referendum on uh, constitutional uh, reform, which would have really neatly situated the problem um, around and forced the Christian Democrats and the, and the opposition to really define themselves as whether they were you know, really for reform as their kind of manifesto argued and as they kind of floridly spoke about in some, in some cases, or whether they were actually reactionaries and just wanted to preserve what was in essence an oligarchical system. Now, the problem with this was that uh, it frightened the leaders of the popular unity. Agenda was probably the one who was least uh, frightened by this prospect because he was used to winning elections although he'd lost a few presidential ones, you know, he knew that when there's a single issue like that, you can, you can win. Um, but, it, you know, the, the idea didn't prosper and it was kind of delayed and it was then brought up, you know, now and again during his government. But he never, um, because he was a Democrat, I think, he never wanted to impose himself on the popular unity. And there, I think there were practical reasons for this. You know, he didn't have a political party of his own. His, his own socialist party didn't really belong to him in any meaningful way. He couldn't control it. And they did what the hell they wanted, let's, let's face it, uh, during his government. So there was probably a very good practical reason for not um, uh, pushing this kind of uh, constitutional plebiscite. Um, but on the other hand, the popular unity won the April 1971 uh, municipal elections with over 50% of the vote. And, you know, if they'd had that kind of constitutional framework for dealing, uh, they would have been able to deal much more effectively with the problems that came later. And so I wonder if Agenda's commitment to democracy wasn't a weakness at that point. Now, there were good reasons for it. Uh, he needed to maintain the unity of the coalition. He didn't want to be a caudillo. He didn't have his own party. But surely he could have, you know, in the way that Tony Blair used to go over the head of the Labour Party and just talk to the masses, you know, and use that as a stick against his own party. You know, maybe Agenda could have reached out to the people to say, look, I think this is what we need to do and force them, you know, to, to, to really accept uh, a quite a daring and bold measure like that. Uh, in relation to the kind of the idea of uh, whether he could have uh, dealt with the military uh, in a different way. It's important not to forget that before he became president, he was uh, before he was inaugurated, he had to sign a pact of constitutional guarantees. And within that pact of constitutional guarantees, there was a commitment uh, to you know freedom of speech, freedom of movement, um, which you know could later be used to to undermine his government, but also a, a set of measures around the military. He wasn't able to change its composition. He, he was to um, refrain from changing, uh, that, that anything pertaining to the military would stay with the high command. So he couldn't create new units. He couldn't uh, change its composition. And, and so this really uh, meant that his, his ability to really uh, transform the military was limited to talking to them. Now, there were, uh, one of his advisors, um, uh, Joan Garces, has written that Allende at one point um, asked him to look at an old civil defense legislation from the 1940s, which envisaged the kind of creation of joint civic military committees 
in order to deal with national emergencies. You know, this harks back to Chile's history of having earthquakes every now, you know, periodically and needing to uh, deal with the impacts of this. And this was looked at, but here it was the leadership of the popular unity that really didn't see this uh, as a solution. I think this is because for those who wanted the more orthodox armed seizure of power, you know, civic military committees, you know, to, to talk about national emergencies, that's not revolution, you know, it does, it's not sexy. Um, and for those who were, you know, like the communists, much more committed to the institutional role, this kind of just sounded like, you know, what, if, you if you weren't going to actually have guns, then what was the point? But uh, Garcés's point and Allende's idea was that this would create a social cultural connection between what was actually quite an isolated um, as it is in most in many countries an isolated social group you know the military operate by their own rules they live in their barracks they're often far away from everybody else and um, they're quite isolated socially and this would have been a way to bring them in uh, and to create connections which could have uh, made a difference. So I think if that type of initiative had prospered, there, there, there were, uh, that you know, had some chances for success. Um, and then you asked about legacy. Uh, and this is a real, um, a really important question because I think the coup did contribute to the legacy in some way. It contributed to the ability of people all around the world uh, whether they were revolutionaries or social democrats or whatever, to to point to a process that had no danger in it anymore. After its defeat, it wasn't dangerous. And so, you know, anyone can talk about the popular unity uh, without risking themselves in a, um, in a political sense. But beyond that, the legacy is in the programme. You know, that program is still relevant today, unfortunately, because the dictatorship, what it did was roll back decades of social victories and political victories that were only partially restored after 1990. And one of the aspects of that was a total demobilization and, a, and, a, and a, a real watering down of democracy from what it had been to really, you know, the formalism of vote, voting every now and then. And it's that that needs to ha happen now in Chile. The re people are asking for the restoration of the role of the state and the reactivation of the social role of the people in decision making. And that's what this, you know, the, the demand for a new constitution is essentially all about. And I don't know if I'm running out of time, Giuliano. Stop me if I am. Uh, well, you can keep, keep going. I've been feeding questions into the... Okay. To, to my question so you can, you can keep going because there are um so there's a legacy within chile which is the unfulfilled program you know it's the it's the uh, uh the the murdered process which halted it for a time but was now um uh, recovering its its importance but there's also the the legacy abroad you know in europe at the time uh the italian communist party uh took the experience of the coup and said, this shows the need for a historic compromise with Christian democracy. We need to pull back on some of the, uh, our, our demands in order to make that alliance with the center. In France, um, you know, Mitterrand uh, pushed the socialists into making an alliance with the communists in order to reach government in, in the early 80s. But in general, the impact on, uh, on Western Europe was uh, to sort of retreat from revolution retreat from the more extremes version of transformation and sort of, sort of by by dint of doing that to sort of legitimize the the scandinavian model as the that's as far as you can go and i think this was you know then uh, underlined with the assassination of olaf palmer in 1986 you know um and but in latin america the legacy maybe explain that very briefly victor who was olaf palmer and what happened because i think that's quite an important episode in the, in the history Okay, well, Olaf Palmer was Prime Minister of Sweden and um, he uh, wanted to uh, accelerate uh, Sweden's movement towards socialism. You know, he considered various uh, economic plans to uh, transfer power to workers in much the same way as Agenda wanted to, you know, to democratize the workplace um, and society. He also pursued a, a non aligned and, and frankly anti imperialist foreign policy. 
Um, and I think it's this that led to his assassination, which you know still hasn't really been uh, solved. It's it's a kind of unsolved crime, really. Um, the, 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 re the reason why I ask, and I'll actually just stop you there, and we'll, we'll come come back to you afterwards, Victor. But but is is because I think um, a certain revival of democratic socialism, the language of democratic socialism in, in recent years in, in the US and in Europe as well, has certainly brought back some of the symbols, as I said, some of the language, some of the, 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 the ideals even um, of, of the Allende period, although the policy program is very different. And that's maybe, that's maybe what differentiates it from Olaf Palmer's uh, time and his, his own rhetoric, his, his policy program. Um, we can get also into, into uh, contemporary legacy in Chile, because there's a, a question on that. So I'll come back to you after going to Christina, if that's all right. Mm. Yeah, no, uh, I just wanted to, do you want to um, ask me something specific or I just wanted to... Well, you, you, you can follow in, uh, follow on. I do, I do have a question for you, but you, you go and then I'll interrupt you. Well, I, I just wanted to, to follow up to what uh, Victor was saying, because um, we, we, we mustn't, uh, uh, in terms of or what it could have been done um, differently, perhaps, but one of the things we mustn't forget that the agenda government also agenda gets into power in the time of the you know that historically we are we are within the cold war and uh, internationally i think there isn't um a lot of uh, support because of the conditions that 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 had occurred um to to the gov to, to the government of agenda at that time um with respect to, to, to whether he could have um, perhaps um, have engaged the military, I think uh, one, again, mustn't forget that in Chile, the, the um, structure of, of the military power in Chile is, is a very, um, is very tightly linked to a, a, the, the, the class, of, of very high class in Chile. I mean, most of the uh, people who go to the military school, air force, uh, or naval, are people who come from from the, the the high aristocracy or in Chile or the high classes in Chile. It's the structure of of the the army it's it's it's, it's very different. Oh, no, I don't know very different, but it's very 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 closely linked to to um, the class that was not the one that was precisely being benefited by the policies that agenda was introducing. In contrast, for instance, we've seen, I don't want to deviate, but what's going on in Venezuela, where, where the class structure of the Venezuelan uh, for, um, armed forces is, 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 is very different to the one in Chile. So um, I think it, it was always going to be difficult, uh, although there were sectors within um, some of the um, branches of the armed forces, it were there always a minority. Um, um, but the other thing that, that I wanted to mention is that um, in addition to the, uh, I, I, apart from the fact that, that, that the, agenda, the agenda's program was always, from the beginning, was said to develop a socialist program within the frame of the democratic is, uh, institution that existed in the country. He never, I, I think, in, in, even in his program mentioned um, otherwise. So he was quite consistent uh, in that sense. But the, the, the only other point that I wanted to mention is that um, independently of all the internal problems or things that he could have done, it was the role of, of the United States that even before agenda took power, they had already decided um, that they're going to implement a policy where they will not let him to succeed, no matter mm -hmm. what he could have done, um, I think. Um, it, it, we must not forget that even before agenda took power, they, they, they assassinated one of the generals um, of, of, uh, in, yeah. in agenda nice. before he, in order to, uh, to interfere with the ascension to, 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 the, to power. So they, they already had a plan and, and which was implemented, um, I would say, with the first class degree in Chile. Um, and incidentally, look at, uh, watching a very interesting documentary on Iran, I must say, was not different from the, from the plan that they used in Iran to overthrow the government um, uh, there many, many years ago. So you know, it, it were a, a number of 
not only internal but external forces as well that I think were very powerful. And, and it almost has to say that agenda never stood a chance because from the very, very beginning, um, the imperialism and the United States was determined that he, they were not going to let him succeed. And they applied every single tool at their disposal in order to, to avoid that. Thanks, Christina. I'm, I'm gonna come straight back to you. I, I, I... I see there's a number of questions and comments coming through, so please keep them coming through. I have been I have been um, uh, asking them to to our speakers. Um, Carlos here is is saying something actually about uh, Palma, who himself uh, was Sweden's first global politician, who spoke for non-alignment non during the Cold War, an anti-apartheid activist who funded the African National Congress and a champion of anti-colonial liberation movements. Uh, India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, was a friend of Palmer's political mentor, Tej Erlander. I, I think one of, one of the things that's important to recognize, and I think, Victor, you, you've, you've um, opened this discussion, perhaps, in, in showing some of the international connections, is that, yes, what happened in Chile was very specific to Chile, but it was also uh, occurring within the context of, of counter-revolutions, which were really, in many ways, about suppressing uh, social expectations. And those social expectations, once suppressed, would be very difficult to, to regain. Um, as, and certainly through, through institutional means, that has been a challenge over, over the last 30, 40 years. Um, but Christina, I'd like to come back to you on, on a point on international solidarity um, and how that was shaped by the experience uh, of the UP government. So you, uh, were a political prisoner in, in, the, in, in the aftermath of, of the coup. You were a survivor um, of, of political imprisonment and, and torture, and, and you left Chile and, and you fled to the UK, where you were received by uh, the Chile Solidarity Campaign, uh, mere representatives of the Chile Solidarity Campaign. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you how, how the formation of that campaign's activities, but also more generally the, the international solidarity that was, was offered to, to Chileans, was shaped by the imagination of those who had been in Chile uh, during the period of, of the Allende government. Yes, I mean, um, as you said, I came, I came to England um, in 1976 um, uh, as a political refugee um, at the time where um, refugees were not only welcome but very much supported. Um, there was um, a, a, a very active um, movement, a solidarity movement, movement um, with Chile, um, composed by mostly native um, people from the UK, many of whom are still involving campaigns of solidarities with other countries. And we really as Chileans, um, we benefited enormously from this uh, solidarity. Um, and, and those people were also helping us then to maintain the solidarity with Chile. And perhaps that, that was also when you were talking about the legacy. That, again, for me, is one of the, if I can think of that, is, is one of the legacies, I think, that we, 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 we had from, from the gender. Gen government, because even during this government, um, agenda showed incredible solidarity uh, at, at sometimes having to pay some very high political cost for that solidarity, certainly when he invited Fidel Castro and supported the Cuban revolution at that time. We're talking about the 70s when it wasn't that consolidated as it is today, but certainly with um, with some, I remember some um, people who were fleeing, fleeing Uruguay from the dictatorship there who were going to be ca captured and, and needed asylum and agenda interfere directly um, it, in order to give them protection and bring them into Chile as, uh, as, as refugee. So in spite of all the difficulties that he was facing, he, he never lost this important sense of international solidarity, which I think is, is Mark, his government. Um, we had even at the university, um, people who had uh, escaped um, the, the dictatorship even from Brazil. I mean, I, perhaps you are even, you, you, your history is part of that. I mean, I think you, 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 
your, your parents, your father certainly had had to leave Brazil and was received in Chile. So uh, that is an important legacy that uh, certainly we Chilean, and I think anybody who believes in, 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 who, in, in socialism and the values of, of justice and solidarity must never forget. And, and because of that, uh, certainly I have been throughout the years involved in, in some causes that I, I have felt ha had been just and, and like the Abahad and the Abahad movement um, very much against the war in Iraq, uh, more recently very much against the intervention of, inter intervention of the United States in Venezuela and so on and so forth, and also continuing the issue of solidarity with Chile. So, um, certainly, I think this is, if, it, if there is one of the legacies, this is an important legacy of, of a, a government of, 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 of agendas, ideals, and, and uh, yeah. Thank you, Christina. Okay, so I'm going to um, ask a few of the questions that, that have been posted here in the chat. Uh, as I've written on, on the chat, please let me know if you'd like to ask them yourself. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll, I'll read. I'll read one out to start with, actually, which is, is from Tim Oxton. Um, he says, "If I understood Victor right, in, in the UP Manifesto of 1970, there was a specific commitment to defend the commercial interest. Uh, sorry, not to defend commercial interest. To defend indigenous people of the South against threats by commercial interests. Um, in, in 2020, those same Mapuche people face the same kind of uh, commercial interests." grabbing their land, how does the situation now compare with that of 50 years ago? So maybe you, you, can, you can talk about the Mapuche struggle uh, in the context of that period and, and today. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on the Mapuche struggle, um, but what I do know is that uh, 50 years ago on uh, the election of Salvador Allende, um, the uh, indigenous people um, were able to begin negotiating um, with uh, a Chilean government on an equal footing for the first time uh, and with broad cultural support for their aspirations. Um, at the end of that, there was an agreement which unfortunately was never uh, rolled out, partly because of the uh, political blockade of the opposition in parliament. Um, but there was a commitment to establish uh, an indigenous university uh, in Temuco. Um, there was going to be restitution of lands. Mapuzungun, the language of the Mapuche people, was going to be recognized as uh, a state language. And there was going to be, uh, and they were uh, going to be allowed to use the language in schools uh, across the areas uh, um, that they would be in control of again. So, you know. Today, the situation is very different. You know, the Araucanía, the, 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 the Mapuche area is militarized. Um, the Mapuche movement is uh, repressed violently. And there have been, I think, I'm not wrong, I think there's been 12 deaths since 2005. Um, but there have also been, uh, you know, multiple cases of torture. And um, there have been repeated hunger strikes over the last 20 years by Mapuche leaders. Um, who essentially uh, are being uh, ignored by the Chilean government and by repeat, you know, by successive uh, Chilean governments. So I think in that sense, you know, the Allende government is an example uh, to be followed in its treatment of uh, the indigenous people, at least in terms of engaging with them as equals. Um, uh, and that is a legacy that hopefully uh, will be repeated uh, in uh, the if Chile votes for a new constitution um, uh, in October. Thanks, Victor. There's there's a couple of questions here that I suppose could be uh, uh, summarized in in three words: reform or revolution. Um, which is a question I'll, I'll I'll pose back to you, Victor, in in a minute. Uh, about, so you can prepare for this one, uh, about the possibilities of socialist transformation today. 
um, and, and lessons that maybe the left can learn in Chile. Maybe you can talk about El Frente Amplio in, in Chile, how that draws on, on, on that particular legacy, what it's tried to do on the streets and in parliament, uh, or, or the new movement on the streets and in parliament. Um, but I'll go back to Cristina first. Um, and I wanted to ask you about labor politics in the UK. Uh, because the Labour Party was very uh, involved in, in, in one sense in, in, in supporting the solidarity campaign, um, provided a, a political uh, basis for, for the activities of the solidarity campaign, but at the same time um, the political uh, engagement of solidarity campaigners was, was, was limited in some sense by, by the, the political outlook of the Labour Party. Um, and, and obviously as the Labour Party changed over the next 20, 30 years, uh, solidarity campaigns like the Chile Solidarity Campaign became marginalised in, in some way. Um, I live in Brazil and I, I'm actually, I don't like to use the word pessimistic, but I, I, don't, I don't see that in today's context, um, international solidarity can have the same weight as it perhaps had in the past because of the particular way that late capitalism has developed because of the success really of that counter-revolution to diminish expectations. Um, and so I, I wanted to, you to maybe talk a little bit about the evolution of the relationship between solidarity and labor politics in, in the UK. Yeah, certainly at the time, at the time of the coup and when the Chilean refugees came into this country, um, we had a lot of support not only from uh, independent people who did not belong to a particular party, but certainly from the Labour Party itself. I mean, it was thanks to, um, to the fact that, that uh, during the agenda government, the, 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 the Labour government had approved the overseas, to the overseas department had approved a loan to Chile. And when the coup came, uh, Judith Hart, who was then uh, the minister, um, th they decided to convert that loan into um, scholarships for Chilean refugees, uh, which was something that we certainly we benefited incredible of most of the Chilean refugees that came at that time. Um, I don't, I cannot see how you could find something like that today within <laughs> the, the policies of the Labour Party, but certainly as time has gone by, the Labour Party has become less, I feel, less and less willing to provide support in terms of solidarity to, to with, with, with refugees or political refugees, especially from many, any part, many part of the world. And it, and it is actually a shame, but it's become more and more defensive. And especially in, in this policy of, of, of blaming refugees from anything that goes wrong in the country and, and, and for, for, for the consequences of the, 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 the implementation of the policy of austerities by conservative governments, which have affected the population in the UK, but people have always been, they always tend to blame the refugees. Uh, I, I, I don't think, um, at least certainly the Labour Party under Tony Blair and, and, and even today, uh, perhaps, uh, always too, too short to, 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 to know exactly the policy. I don't think that they, they, they have a very a strong desire to, to have a very strong policy of international solidarity, um, except very small groups within the Labour Party that are really almost marginalized. Um, I felt different certainly would have been the situation um, if Jeremy Corbyn didn't Jeremy Corbyn campaign and if Jeremy Corbyn had been ele elected, but I, 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 unfortunately, I cannot see that um, happening very much. Um, and and uh, so, so I mean, that's, that's unfortunately, that's, that's all I have to say. I'm not very optimistic uh, um, about the attitude of the policies of the Labour parties in, chain, in, in terms of uh, providing this uh, so international solidarity today. I would like to be proven wrong, wrong, but um, that's how I, I that's how I feel today. Certainly, very different to what we had um, in the time that we, we came to Chile, we, we came to the UK. Optimism of the will. Yeah. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go back to of the, of the, the brain. I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. Pessimism of the intellect, yeah. yeah. Um, 
I'll, I'll go back to Victor. Victor, I'll just read out the two questions that I was referring to, perhaps. So the first is, uh, could I ask Victor in, in relation to the lessons of the coup drawn by Berlinger and the Italian communists, does he think that the idea that the democratic route towards socialist transformation must of necessity wait upon a much broader social base, including social democratic em elements? Uh, and the other one, uh, if I can find it quickly, uh, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a, a reference to somebody, uh, Jeremy Fox, who worked in, in Mexico with Chilean refugees, uh, some of them prominent in the Upe government, um, and there was an enormous difference in their, in their outlook. Some saw that uh, Allende socialists were sort of armchair, armchair revolutionaries. Um, but maybe I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like you to discuss that, um, that tension in, in relation to today's politics. So the sort of reform or revolution, streets versus parliament, uh, I'll pass over to you. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that I've got enough optimism for, for both me and Cristina. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all is not lost. Maybe, maybe I'm just like, you know, um, you know, not as intellectual. I don't know. Um, the, for me, th there's one thing that, um, in, in relation to this issue of whether the democratic road needs a, a, broad, a broader social base, um, you know, if, essentially it does, yeah. And th this goes back to a kind of historic tension, in, uh, particularly in the, in the international communist movement. Um, once it's, it's, it's kind of decided after the war that, you know, the armed revolution isn't the only path to power and in the wake of the popular fronts as well, you know, that um, there, there are other ways of, of achieving power. Well, then it becomes a numbers game, you know, because that's what democracy in, in its current Western kind of form is, you know, it's who, who wins more votes. And that, that means that requires a broad social base, but that doesn't mean that you can, you have to surrender your identity or your agency or your demands. Um, and I think the experience of the Chilean left shows that very clearly. You know, you've got quite a heterogeneous left, broadly speaking Marxist, but, you know, incorporating from, you know, communists uh, all the way over to, you know, uh, people infused by the Cuban revolution and, and Trotsky um, in, in a single coalition. Why? Because they're united around a goal. And th this is, you know, the issue of unity is universal. And it's often just talked about as a kind of catechism, you know, we've got to, the people united, we need to be united. But what is unity? Unity is agreement around a goal. You know, are we going to get the bus? Are we going to walk? Uh, that's, you know, in a group of friends. You know, you need unity around an idea and that, that depends on the goal. If the goal is to all be together for as long as possible, then maybe you walk to where you're going. Um, rather than if, if it's speed, and the, the point is to get one person there, then maybe one person jumps on a motorbike, you know? I know that oh, that's simplifying it, but the issue is unity has to be around method and goal. And this goes back to the question that was asked earlier on about whether those in Agenda's government understood or supported the project in the way that he uh, understood it. And I think the clear answer is no. Um, not everybody in that government uh, really understood or, or even supported the what we might call the agendista road to socialism, the Chilean road to socialism, because they uh, felt, we might call them, you know, they had a more orthodox understanding of revolution that you need to seize power, smash institutions, and then rebuild something new on the ashes of the old. Um, Agenda's perspective uh, was to, to build as you go within institutions um, unfortunately this is very difficult to explain as a revolution in the context of a national liberation struggle around the world which is armed uh, in the context of the Cuban revolution in the context of even the Russian revolution having been uh, or being sold as an armed seizure of power um, which underestimated the political elements within all of those revolutions. Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, is reform, is the democratic route possible? Um, of course it is. It really is possible. You know, just the election of Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party shows the possibility 
but a series of lessons need to be learned and internalized by any left that hopes to achieve power through democratic means. One is that, uh, as someone, uh, as Francisco Dominguez said the other day, uh, the issue is about hegemony within the left and within society as a, as a whole. And how you achieve that is a social movement. You've got to achieve and begin developing your own culture, your own institutions, your own way of thinking, and propagate that in a much more effective manner than the kind of passive culture that comes through the TV and gaming and you know all the, 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 the attributes of modern culture today. You have to build society against an atomizing society, an atomizing system. And you also have to have internal clarity on method and goals. Um, you also have to have street smarts, I would say. You know, like there's a kind of naivety around some sectors of the left in, in Europe and in the United States, I would say, in particular. Um, not necessarily around the role of intelligence agencies or, you know, but around the role of information uh, as, a, as a method of conflict um, and, you know, around the role of the media in particular, uh, but also around the role of international relations. And, you know, now we're in the midst of a, a new Cold War against China and we're being urged to believe that the Chinese are massacring Uyghurs left, right and centre, you know, how many of us know whether that's true? We, you know, we know the Guardian lied to us about Corbyn, but we're happy to believe them on China. I think there's, there's a naivety there that prevents us from looking around the world to look at models that we can use and look for support in places and solidarity in places that before um, was more possible. Because I think we did have a left that was more smart about the realities of power nationally and internationally. Um, and finally, I think, you know, Cristina made a point earlier on about uh, Agenda never really having a chance because the external forces, you know, US imperialism and, and its local allies in Brazil and so on were too powerful. And I think this it underestimates the issue of internal weakness. At the end of the day, it's, your, it's the internal contradictions that lead to defeat or failure. It's, uh, you know, a, um, it's not necessarily the, it's not just the external pressures that lead to these things. And in the case of the popular unity, it was, there was a broad social movement, a political movement for some kind of change, but there was a lack of agreement and definition on methods and on the, the meaning of the goal. You know, the goal is revolution, but what's a revolution? Well, everyone thought, everyone had their own definition. Agenda's revolution was institutional. Uh, Fidel Castro's and, and the Mites were and that of a sector of the Socialist Party was, uh, you know, to arm the people and smash the institutions of state. And the, the problem with that road is it doesn't leave anywhere for the people that actually have the guns in society. You know, where are the guys that actually have the guns in a modern society going to go if, you're, if your revolution involves smashing them? You know, um, and, and this is, a, a, again, I guess, part of the smart, uh, politics. You, ha you have to have messages for all parts of society. You know? um, and I think that's something that perhaps the Labour Party lacked uh, in recent, uh, you know, in, under the recent uh, leadership. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you, but I'm going to ask you just uh, one, one question to finish. And maybe if you have any concluding comment, then I'll go to Christina with a final question and, and concluding comment. Um, okay. It's on, it's on the, the, the referendum on the constitution, which has been suspended until October, I believe. I'm not sure if, if that's right. Um, that's right. What, what, what are your hopes for that? Um, my hopes for that are that people will vote for, um, for a constituent assembly and uh, that then the constituent process uh, will um, lead to the radicalization that Chile's seen in the last uh, year uh, becoming institutionalized and deepened because it's, it's, it will now be not just about resistance, but about construction. And that is not just my hope, but I think the hope of many Chileans, you know, in recent uh, days, there have been many events commemorating uh, the 50th, anniver 50th anniversary of the victory of the popular unity. And there's a very good reason for that. 
the popular unity was a response to a systemic crisis. Chile is today involved in a systemic crisis, is suffering the effects of the systemic crisis and with a pandemic laid on top. And it needs a new set of rules in which, uh, which will allow it to scramble Chilean society out of the hole that it is in right now. And, you know, achieve those goals of making uh, a society fit for people to live in. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, uh, over to Christina for, for a last response and a concluding comment. Uh, there's a question from Sabrina, which is about the, the way in which different solidarity ca campaigns or, or, or groups of exiled people uh, from the Southern Cone um, came together, the way in which they built relationships with each other and, and how solidarity wasn't only just directed towards Chile, but directed towards Latin America, I think, if I, if I understand the question correctly. And then maybe you can conclude, Christina, we've only got five minutes uh, to finish, but maybe you can conclude with a, with a message on, on solidarity, on international solidarity. Um, what's it you would like people to take away from this event? Uh, about the 50th anniversary of the UP government and, and put that into solidarity work? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, on, on, on the specific question that you asked about the solidarity with the Southern Cone, I must, I must say that um, when, we, when, when we came to England, um, um, most of the solidarity was with the Chilean refugees. Uh, for reasons that we, we, we don't have time to discuss today, there wasn't the same support and solidarity with the people from the other countries that were uh, suffering uh, under as brutal dictatorship as, as the Chilean world, well, certainly Argentina and Uruguay, as there was for Chile. And perhaps the reason is, is it was mentioned earlier on, because um, most people were not afraid of supporting um, what they saw the failure of, of, of the popular unity in Chile. Um, so, so somehow, um, because uh, in a way, Allende had been elected, uh, democratically elected. Um, so uh, for one reason or another, um, most of the solidarity was directed um, towards the Chilean and not with the rest of the other countries in, in this, which I, 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 thought, I thought it was really sad, but that was the reality. Um, and in fact, um, that's something that I think needs to be changed. But one of the things that I just wanted to mention, and uh, if you let me, about what, what, what Victor was saying about the, the, this conflict of the left, because I, I keep coming to that. I've, one of the important legacies, and I, and, I wanted, uh, and, I, and I want to reflect as well on what's going on in Chile today with the, with the, with the younger generation, with this uh, social explosion that has occurred in Chile and with this uh, calling for the plebiscite, is the need to call uh, for unity. Um, all the experiences um, in, uh, all over the, uh, the world show how easy it is for, for the left to, to divide and to be divided so easily and so quickly. Um, and, and therefore, we're never able to achieve the, the critical mass and vote that would allow us to implement changes in a society. And that's something that we really need to think about it. Uh, but certainly, unity per se is, 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 not, is, is not what I'm saying. But, but as, as I think to say, it has to be unity behind a program. It has to be a real and clear program where um, the majority of, uh, of the parties and group of the left can be united um, and then support that program as much as possible, but also support that program, support the, the, the pathway that is the democratic uh, um, uh, changes, but that doesn't include, and we haven't touched about, 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 upon that, and I just wanted to mention, the need to build um, the popular support to develop the social movement, which is the one that has to be behind those changes. Um, whether it is within the democratic institution, within the democratic institution, I, I totally agree. But you need to have this a strong support and movement that would force more and more each time the changes, and and it will allow it would it would push the changes forward. And I think 
um, in general, I, and it's happened, we've seen in Latin America that unfortunately, when we have built that support, somehow we had taken it, take it for taking it for granted as it was I think excuse me I'm not fully aware but I think Brazil a little bit with the incredible support that the PT had with Nula that then somehow went away uh, in Bolivia and in many other countries so whichever whichever way we want to go forward we we must make sure that we bring along and 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 involve the group the social movement and and of 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 that, that would um, allow us to take the program further within, obviously within the institutions that, that, that are there. So, and, and in Chile today, um, I think that's why, for instance, the, 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 the groups in Chile today, that is a big sector and it worries me, that are, are very skeptical even about this plebiscite. Um, they feel that they are not going to go again and, and, and lend their vote to these established political parties that have failed them for years and years, um, which I think is a mistake because I think that's the only thing that we have at the moment. But, but I can understand where they're coming from because they have been left behind. I mean, they have been totally ignored and, and they are the ones that have now been in Chile uh, demonstrating, putting their bodies in front of the, 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 the the bullets and losing lives and sights and eyes and and they want to be represented they want to be there when 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 the, when policies are created and when people are elected to represent them so i i think it's it's yes let's let's follow the democratic route let's go through the institutions that are there but let's make sure that we at the same time build a very strong um, support um, within the communities and, 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 and the, the social movement, as I call it. And for the future, well, I think we have to keep, we have to keep fighting, we have to keep um, resisting. Um, and I just would really like to uh, dedicate this discussion in a way um, which I'm, I'm really delighted with, with Victor, who always, I always learn from him. Um, I want to dedicate this to all our um, comrades, compañeros y compañeras who had fallen in this pathway of um, to achieve a, a more just society, uh, not only from Chile, from, from Latin America and from all over the world. Um, I really would like to take this, this, this opportunity to, to dedicate um, this event and, 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 and our words and discussion to, to the memories of, of those of the people that are not here with us today and who gave their lives for in the search the quest to try to build a more just society so in the, in the name we have to keep fighting we have to keep being optimistic and um, thank you very much for for this discussion thank you christina for that um, moving and and and, and rousing uh, concluding statement um a very fitting end and thanks also for reaffirming the importance of uh, the, the focus on social movements, on social basis. Uh, I, I probably should have directed you more towards towards that point, and hopefully, in a, in a future conversation, we can we can pick that up. Um, I want to start by by thanking our two speakers, Christina mm -hmm. and Victor. Say it's been an absolute pleasure for me to to share this platform with the two of you, and, and an honour. Um, mm -hmm. And to thank those of you who have um, who have engaged. Um, I notice we have a a, a speaker who, who's just arrived, a, a guest who's arrived with us, um, Jeremy Corbyn. Perhaps we can offer a few, you'd like to say a, a, few, a few words at the end of this conversation on, on the 50th anniversary. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll be very brief because I didn't hear all of the discussion. I'm sorry, I've only just come on to it. I've had some other things that I had to be doing. I, I just was talking the other day to, friend of mine, a young student, Tom Rayside, who's studying a lot about the history of Chile at university. And he came to pick my brains about what the support for an opposition was to popular unity um, at the time. And um, we had quite a long discussion about it. And um, as one who's been uh, 
great supporter of Chile and the uh, socialist movements in Chile uh, all of my political life. It was quite interesting to have a reflection with him, who is much younger, about, about all this. What we concluded was that um, the explosion of popular support for socialism in Chile in the 1970s was built on a very long tradition of an active communist party, an active socialist party, and I think a contribution of Spanish Republicans who went to Chile and many other groups within the country. What was also different about it was that it um, tried to encompass the needs of indigenous people of Chile in a way that many of the left parties in Latin America didn't always do and probably don't do enough of even still. And um, it was also a cultural explosion and a cultural, a cultural movement. And I think it's quite important to recognize the importance of marrying together a cultural feeling of the strength of working class culture, of working class traditions, of the art, the music and the excitement that's there in those communities with the very important political analyses and economic structures and things that you have to put together. And that gave us popular unity and gave, gave us the achievements that popular unity had. But it was always going to be under attack from the rich, the powerful, the monopolies, the United States and everybody else. And you think about it, this was 1970, internet hadn't been heard of, phone calls internationally were unusual and um, Chile was very, very isolated and dangerously isolated. And eventually, of course, what happened was the military got stronger, the opposition was funded by the CIA and outside, and the coup took place, the murders took place, and the killing took place. The support around the world for the opposition, for popular unity, for Allende, was absolutely massive. And whilst thousands died, thousands suffered in the most disgusting way, there was um, there's some sort of poetic justice at the end of all this. <coughs> Who's remembered? Pinochet and his vile henchmen generals as anything but disgusting people with a disgraceful record. And who's remembered as the heroes of it all? Salvador Allende, Victor Hara, and all the others that stood up for something different. And what's interesting now is that um, young people who were born long after Allende had been killed, long after Allende had been killed, um, decided that they are also in thrall of the heroism the heroism of those people at that time. And so I just wanted to say this, thank you to all of the Chilean community for all they've done. And that um, let's have faith in the young people of Chile and the young people of, of the world, because it is a youth movement that's going on at the present time around the world. And you see it in the United States, you see it in this country, you see it elsewhere, that it's young people, that are actually looking for a collective solution to the world's problems. We won't deal with the environmental crisis by propping up a system of big business, free enterprise and multinational corporations and military governments. It can only be done by socialists working together all around the world in order to deal with the crisis of what we are doing to this planet and what we're doing to the poorest and most dispossessed people in this planet. So, Let's be strong, be strong in support of each other and be strong in the whole principles of popular unity. And one of my favorite Chileans of all time has got to be the great Pablo Neruda. They can cut all the flowers, but they cannot stop the coming of spring. Show that t-shirt. And I've got it on the shirt here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Jeremy, thank you so much for that important and rousing uh, concluding statement, um, a, a very fitting uh, end to this discussion, I, I feel. Um, and I suppose as, as chair, it falls to me also to thank you for, for your contribution to solidarity with Latin America over so many, uh, uh, so many decades, uh, your contribution to labor politics uh, in the UK and, and abroad. Um, it's and so, always uh, there, always there. I'll be around.
<laughs> oh, well. Good. I, I think Latin Americans everywhere will, will, will be counting on that. Yeah. Uh, long struggle, long live popular unity. Um, and, and with that, I'll bring today's discussion, today's event to, to an end. Uh, I'd like to mention that you can find today's uh, event recorded. Uh, it, will, it will go on to Alborada's website. I think it's alborada.net forward slash e-news. You can also um, access all the other videos, the other discussions that have happened in recent months on Bolivia, on Brazil, on Venezuela. Um, and you can, you can do that as well on the Alborada website. We're going to finish with a, a video of, of a moment that I, I think is, um, is, is, is very important, perhaps a, a, one, of, one of the emblematic moments um, of, of the last few, few months um, in terms of uh, the, 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 the legacy of, of the Allende period. It's a, it's a clip of Inti Ilimani singing uh, El Pueblo Unido um, in Plaza Dignidad in Santiago during the huge protests that happened at the end of last year. <coughs> so that, and I'll leave you with my thanks. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you again at an event soon. All the very best.